first a little word on the housing data which seems to be holding up rather well do you have any explanation for why that might be in pandemic times yeah well this is march and this was when the pandemic was starting to bite uh and so that you might have expected to see more action than we are actually seeing and either way uh, but it's it looks uh, fairly similar you know the uh, uh the increase the monthly increase from uh, February to March was uh, about a half a percentage point. That's not annualized higher than the previous month. Uh, but that's mostly seasonal. Uh, we normally start to see some uh, increases in March uh, for the, uh, uh, as, we, as we approach the summer months. So it, it's pretty um, uh, unsurprising. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it hasn't taken, if there is going to be a coronavirus impact, it hasn't happened yet. Didn't happen in April, most likely either. We're getting new home sales up 0.6%, which is also a bit of a shock. But I want to talk about narratives, Professor Schiller, because obviously that's your latest book, The Narratives That Rule This Marketplace. And clearly we have a huge divergence between the stock market and the real economy here. The stock market continues to grind higher another week and another 2% of a gain today. What narrative is it that is ruling this marketplace right now? Well, it's, it's always multiple narratives. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, I think the story right now is something about uh, uh, a, a cure for this uh, uh, thing coming. Uh, it's a, a, a narrative uh, th that uh, people remember recent drops, sharp drops in the stock market in uh, the, the, the um, late winter of 2018 and then at the end of 2018, and they both had V-shaped recoveries. There's a lot of talk about the so-called V-shaped recovery. Uh, there's fear of missing out. This is a term that Goldman Sachs recently brought up that, uh, you know, I, I didn't catch those other v, Vs. I want to catch mm -hmm. this one. And it's Donald J. Trump. Uh, I, I don't know which way he cuts, but we're talking so much. Everything is related to him in our current national talk. I know the, uh, the guys at Goldman used to always say YOLO, and now it's um, FOMO. Bob, uh, Matt Miller here in Berlin. Great to talk to you again. I, I want to ask you about a trend I'm hearing about from my old friends in Bronxville, which is purely anecdotic, anecdotal. But what I'm hearing is that renters from New York City are flooding out to the suburbs of New York in order to get away from the densely packed urban centers. Um, right. and, and they're putting in big bids for, you know, en masse for the one to two million uh, dollar region in terms of those, um, you know, those sort of ritzy suburbs. Is that going to be a trend that we see across the nation? Are people, do people want to get out of the densely packed urban centers? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I sometimes think that uh, this is a repeat of a different kind of uh, narrative. In 1949, the uh, uh, Russian, the Soviet Union, tested successfully an atomic bomb. And they also uh, had missiles <laughs> that they were developing. And this led to a mass exodus to the suburbs. Uh, so there, there could be something like, it's not only because you're afraid of the next uh, virus being uh, very damaging in the center cities. It's also that a lot of the charm of the central cities that, that it draws people in uh, are going to be lessened, like eating out in nice different restaurants and going to museums and shows. Uh, uh, so I think there could be a transition toward uh, living in the, in the country, especially if you're working at home. If that becomes a new norm, then you don't, uh, you don't have the commute uh, to worry about. But on the other hand, there might be a supply response. In the, you know, it might not be that dramatic. And in fact, because there's lots of places to build further from the city, and so that might hold the price increases in the in the uh, distant suburbs uh, down. We we see the average mortgage rate um, back down from the from the COVID-19 spike now right around 358, I think. Do you expect that um, to fall any further? Do you expect the Fed to, to try and pull it down any further? 
Well, they've got the short rates down to just about zero. Uh, they might try some kind of yeah, quantitative easing. Uh, they might just succeed in getting it down a little bit. But, you know, it's pretty low now, and it, uh, I don't know how much that's going to impact the housing market. You know, the, the mortgage rates don't seem very related to the housing market, surprisingly. The, the one exception is around 1982 when... Uh, uh, Interest rates were in double-digit rate. Mortgage, you know, you couldn't get a mortgage for less than 15% or more. Uh, and that did bring housing prices down, those extremes. But if we, you know, if we were to lower a, to a negative 1% federal funds rate, I don't think, I don't see that as a major determinant of the behavior of home prices. Bob, can I ask you about the CAPE ratio? How do you calculate something like a CAPE ratio, you know, a, a, a PE when E is basically just, a, you know, a blob of uncertainty right now? Well, one thing, yeah, E is very, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult for practically any metric that one uses to try to forecast the market. It's always been difficult to forecast the market. It's even harder now. But I think one thing is that the CAPE ratio is going to be better than the uh, conventional uh, price earnings ratio, uh, which is typically based on 12 month earnings, uh, because uh, the, the impact of the current uh, events will be much less on a 10 year average of earnings than on a one month earning. Bob, can I just ask you um, the MLive team typically puts together a question of the day. And uh, the question we're going to see later on that Bloomberg uh, terminal blog is, why are the real and financial worlds diverging? It strikes me that this is a question we heard a lot of people asking after the great financial crisis as well. Um, do you see that? Do you see uh, the market diverging from the underlying economy? And if so, why? Well, the market has always had a tenuous relation to the underlying economy. I thought you were going to bring up the Great Depression. Uh, according to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, there was no plague of locusts. That's his words. Uh, so th there wasn't any real shock. The market seemed to have a life of its own. Uh, so that, that has been uh, a reality uh, for most of our history. There's uh, excess volatility, as I argued, of how many years ago was this? <laughs> Decades ago. <laughs> Uh, because of speculative motives. So we are in a speculative situation where people see uh, fundamental changes coming and they don't know what they mean. We may be, as I was saying before, working at home more. Uh, we may see venerable institutions uh, have to make fundamental changes and these fundamental changes will change the market value of these in ways that are hard to foresee. So uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that there's a separate movement of the stock market and the economy. Uh, we've seen that many times before.